These are kind of like my favorite meal. I don't mind eating it more than once. Hebrews chapter 12, and we will read verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Today I'd like to preach to you from these verses a message that I've entitled, Running at God's Pace. Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning to ask that as we look in your word, you would open our minds and open our hearts to understand and, Lord, to truly heed the truth of your word. I understand that there's nothing that I could say or do that would make a difference in light of eternity. The flesh profits nothing. It is the spirit that quickens. And this word that you have given us, it is spirit and is life to us. And, and Lord, I just pray today that each of us would listen closely to what the Holy Spirit wants to tell us with an attitude of submission, desiring to be obedient and to follow your will for our lives. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The message that I'm preaching this morning is one that is really something that the Lord has been working on my heart about over the last many months, pretty much um, since the beginning of this year. You know, truth, the truth is life is short. I think we recognize that. And we know that James says our life is but a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. And it is true that the longer you live, the shorter it seems. Um, not just because it seems like the finish line is probably closer, but it just seems that life goes faster. Uh, things happen more quickly. And, and we, we sometimes just get the overwhelming sense that life is passing us by. And so... Sometimes in a, in a vain effort to get more out of the little bit of time that we have, we strive to get things done faster and faster so that we can do more and more, and we end up in a constant state of hurry. More often than not, we are hurrying from one thing to the other, and that hurried pace of life eventually results in fatigue, frustration, and ultimately complete disillusion. Christians sometimes justify their hurry by saying, well, I'm simply redeeming the time. But rushing to get things done is never the best use of your time. Giving your all does not mean doing something as fast as you can get it done as hard as you can go, or without ever stopping. Sometimes the best use of our time is to be inactive. Allowing our bodies and our souls to rest and to rejuvenate. And I believe that one of the things that is missing in Christianity, especially in America today, is the balance of running the race of life at God's pace. Now, the root cause of this chronic hurriedness that we struggle with, and we all struggle with it to one degree or another, can be summed up in one word, impatience. Look at our text again, Hebrews 12, verse number 1, the very last phrase in that verse. It says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Have you ever thought about how that's, that's, that's kind of an irony? I don't know about you, but I don't run anywhere unless I'm trying to get there quickly. You know, otherwise, I'm conserving energy. <laughs> but this verse tells us that we are to run, but to do it patiently. 
This seems kind of contradictory because when we think of being patient, we think of just waiting and doing nothing or very, doing very little maybe. But this is what we're commanded to do. So often we, though, are, are so impatient that we, we don't run with patience. Instead, we, we rush. We can't wait to see a project done or a goal achieved, so we rush and we hurry to get things done. We want to be productive. We want to be able to check off that list. Some of you in here, you are chronic, chronic list checkers. I know how it is. I know the satisfaction of writing a list and then checking those things off. There's been times where I've gone back and I wrote a list of the things that I did already just so that I could have the satisfaction of checking them off, you know. I get that. We want to get those things done. We want that satisfaction. We want to be able to, to see the results. But if we would focus, can I put it this way, on living our life more efficiently instead of more quickly, we would find that we would accomplish more and the quality of the results of our life would be even better. We'll be more rested and more content living at God's pace than we will ever be sprinting through life at our own. Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2 tells us how we can do this. Because I know that's the question that we're all asking. I mean, what, what we're talking about, yes, that sounds good. I mean, being rested, feeling rejuvenated, knowing that you're doing just what you're supposed to be doing and you're not wasting your energy doing things that are unnecessary, that all sounds great in theory, but how do we do it? What are the steps here that we take? Those are what we find in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. And I, I imagine that we're going to be taking both this morning service and tonight to look at both of these verses in detail. This morning, focusing primarily on verse number one, and then tonight primarily on verse number two. But as we look at these, we see some several big ideas that we, we need to grasp these ideas. We need to put these into action in our life in order to run life at God's pace. Number one, we need to take off or get rid of the things that are weighing us down. Because carrying unnecessary baggage of any sort is just going to cause us to have to expend more strength than is needful to accomplish anything in our life. Secondly, we have to let go of any sin because it will surround us and it will hold us back. And then thirdly, most importantly, we need to keep our focus on following Christ because He is our pace setter. You are not competing in the race of life against your fellow Christians. Let's get that idea out of our head. This is not a competition between you and any other Christian. The goal of the race of, of life is to finish in the footsteps of Jesus. That's it. He is your pace setter. Follow Him and Him alone. If you get your gaze off of Christ, if you fix your eyes anywhere else, you will veer off course and you will lose time having to make the corrections. So that's kind of the broad overview of where we're going today. Let's break it down now into smaller chunks and consider how we can run life's race at God's pace. First of all, in verse number one, it says, Wherefore, we, seeing <clears throat> we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Just a brief word about the cloud of witnesses mentioned here. It's referring back to Hebrews chapter 11, which is, some people call it the hall of faith in Scripture, because it's a list of many, many people from Old Testament Scriptures who lived by faith in God. And because of that, they saw God do great things in their life. We have people like Noah. We have people like Moses, Abraham, Rahab, and some who are not even mentioned by name, but their stories are related to us, us briefly as an encouragement that if they could live by faith, having not received yet the promise of the Messiah, the Savior to come, and not receiving uh, uh, that in their lifetime, how much more can we run by faith since Christ has already come and we can look back and know that it's already happened? These are the, these are the believers who've gone on, on before us and they ran life's race at God's pace. And they are our cloud of witnesses, it says. Now, the idea of a witness here 
is not the idea of a spectator. Sometimes we, we come to this verse and we get this idea uh, maybe that you're, you're like uh, running in a stadium or something and you're on the track and you've got in the, in the stands all around you, there's all these other great Christians and they're just spectating. That's, that's not quite the idea here. It's actually the idea of a witness or somebody who's actually seen something and actually done something. And so they can bear witness to the truth of it. That's the kind of witness that it is. See, people like Moses and Noah and uh, Joshua and Abraham and all of these Old Testament saints, they're not just watching us, but rather they've already run the race and they testify to you and to me, you can do it by the grace of God. That's the cloud of witnesses that we have. We could talk about many others, perhaps people that you've known in your life, loved ones, dear saints of the Lord who've already passed on. They've run their race. They've completed it. They've finished their course. But now they testify just by their witness and their testimony that you can do it by the grace of God. So seeing we are compassed about, we're, we're circled around with all of these witnesses. Here's the first instruction to us, let us lay aside every weight. Now there's actually two instructions here in this first phrase, let us lay aside every weight and let us lay aside the sin which doth so easily beset us. These are two different categories of things that you and I must get rid of out of our lives if we're going to run the race of life patiently and at God's pace. First of all, we need to get rid of the weights. What are the weights? Well, let's talk about it in this, this illustration, this context of running a race. You know, any serious runner in a race knows the importance of reducing weight in order to be able to run fast and run farther in order to be competitive. And when you, especially when you start talking about, uh, you know, Olympic level or professional level, level racing, uh, they go to great lengths to reduce weight. The average high-end running shoe nowadays weighs less than 10 ounces. And if, and if you can get a shoe that's two ounces less than another, all things being equal, a professional runner is going to go for the lighter shoe because weight will slow you down. Now, in the context here, the weights are talking about things that are not necessarily sinful, but they're unnecessary. They're not strictly necessary to the race of life. And in order to carry these things around, it's going to require us to expend unnecessary effort to run at the right pace. If you've ever seen maybe Olympic runners or uh, maybe you've watched a, a, a charity run or something like that, you, you realize that most people, when they show up to that sort of thing, they don't show up in a ski suit and snow boots with a big backpack on, right? Because that would be silly. First of all, you die from the heat. Second of all, it's going to keep you from being able to run quickly. Well, there are things in our lives that may not be sinful, that are not sinful in and of themselves, but they're unnecessary, and ultimately, they will weigh us down. What kind of things are we talking about here? Well, I think there are, there are really kind of two categories of things. Uh, first of all, there are things that just simply are not best for us. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 12. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 12. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 12. Notice what the Apostle Paul says here. He says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. You see the word expedient there? If you want to circle it or underline it, you might write in the margin uh, of your Bible the word profitable. Profitable. Because in several other places in, the, in, in our Bibles, this same word is translated as profitable. 
I think that's a word we use more frequently, we identify with. Something is profitable when it benefits us in some way. It's good for us. It helps us. What Paul is saying here is that even though there are many things that are technically allowed, they're lawful, not everything is beneficial. I, sure, I could participate in this and I wouldn't be sinning, but would it be helping me? If not, it probably would be something best to set aside so it doesn't hinder you. Now, in context here, uh, he's, he's talking about it really can be anything because he says, I will not be brought under the power of, notice, any. He says, I will not be brought under the power of any. So it doesn't matter what it is. The question we need to ask is not, is it allowed? Is it okay? You know, can I do this without God immediately striking me dead? No, those are the wrong questions. The questions we should ask about uh, everything in our life, whether we're talking about hobbies, whether we're talking about the job we take, whether we're talking about, uh, I mean, just anything. The question is not, is it allowed? The question is, is it helpful? Is it beneficial, beneficial to me? There are some things that add no value to your life and it will only hinder you by taking away time and energy you could and should spend on something better. So what are some things that could become a weight to us? Well, I can think of a lot of things. Our hobbies can very quickly become weights to us. Look, I, I am... And have nothing against people having a hobby. I think it's a good thing. You need some diversion and some places, uh, some ways to rest and those kinds of things. But you know and I know that hobbies can very quickly become consuming. When all of your spare time is being devoted to fulfilling this hobby, you know what? It's become a weight to you. It's become a weight. I think family can become a weight. We have to be careful of that kind of thing. You know, you think about what the, word, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, if any man come unto me and hate not his father and mother and brother and sister and, and wife, and, then he can't follow me. What was Jesus saying? Was he saying that we, we have to literally hate our family? No, he, in other places, he commands us how to treat our family right. He even made sure that his mother was taken care of. But what he was saying is they have to be in their proper place of priority. And when family takes precedent over God in your life, they've become a weight. Your family's not sinful, but they're hindering you. They're holding you back. I think hobbies, I think family, I think absolutely our jobs can become a weight. They can become a hindrance. We become so consumed with success, of climbing the ladder, of getting the next raise, of uh, this, that, and the other, that it, it zaps all of our strength and our energy, and it takes away from the time we should be spending serving the Lord and following God and in our daily devotions and so on and so forth, and it becomes a hindrance to us. These are the kinds of things that none of them in and of themselves are sinful, but they're not profitable. They're not expedient. And therefore, we need to be willing to set them aside. These are the kinds of weights that in order to set them aside, you need to surrender them. All right, so for these weights, they require surrender. Require you to go to God and say, God, here is this thing. I really enjoy it. I don't think it's sinful. It's something in, by itself is okay, but it may be holding me back. And this may be your prayer to God. I don't know, Lord. Is this holding me back or not? But I want to surrender it to you right now. If you want me to give this up, I will give it up. That should be our attitude. Because nothing should be more important than running the race at God's pace. When you're trying to carry all of these extra things around, you are wearing yourself out. Because you're trying to fit too many things into your already crammed schedule. You're not allowing your body, your soul, your mind to rest. You're going to get tired. You're going to get frustrated. And if it goes on too long, you will eventually faint in the race of life. But then there's another category of, of, of weights that we have. And these are, I think I will just call them the worrisome weights. Turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. I 
I want, I want you to stick with me here and see from this story in Luke chapter 10 about someone who was doing something that was very good, but it was not good for her. And there was something better that she needed to give up the good for so that she could have the better. It's Luke chapter 10 and verse number 40. Luke chapter 10 and verse number 40. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost that thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. You probably know this story, but Jesus came to visit Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And, and when he got there, Martha, which she was probably the older sister, the head of the home as it were, certainly the one in charge of showing hospitality, the Bible says that she was cumbered about much serving. See that word cumbered there? It has the idea of something that's very awkward to handle. We say something's cumbersome, not because it's too heavy to lift, but because it's just awkward, right? It's hard to balance it. It's the idea, very sim not, it is very similar to the, the Hebrews 12, 1, when it talks about laying aside the weights. Weights are things that, that weigh us down, that, that are cumbersome for us to try and carry. And here's Martha, she's cumbered about doing what? Say it again. Much serving. Well, aren't we supposed to serve God? I mean, she was directly serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Wasn't that a good thing? In and of itself, it was not a sin. But it was not good for Martha right now because it be, had become a stumbling block. Because for her, it seems like her identity had become wrapped up in her service and the things that she did. And so she looked at Mary, who was doing nothing, and she thought, she's lazy. And she goes to the Lord Jesus, and, and she's, she's kind of got a rude tone when she says to Him, Do you not care that she's left me alone to serve? Bid her, therefore, come and help me. And now I want you to see what Jesus' words were. He said, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about a great many things. Can I just boil it down to this? Jesus said, you're worried about too much. Yeah, but I want the meal to be right. I, I, I want the house to be clean. Those are, those are good things. Those are important things. But they're not necessarily the most important thing. What was Mary doing? She was sitting at Jesus' feet listening to Him. She was spending time with her Lord and Savior. And you know what Jesus said? He said, She hath chosen the good part that shall not be taken away from her. The implication is, Martha, you need to take a lesson from Mary. You need to lay aside for a little bit the weight of your service so that you can spend time with your Savior. What was she worried and what was she careful and troubled about? We don't know all the things going through her mind. We can only speculate. But I do know this, that many of us are carrying around troubles and cares that are weighing us down. There is no shortage of things in this life that we can worry about. Now, I want to make an important distinction here before I go much further. To give in to the temptation to worry is a sin. Because Philippians 4, verse 6, commands us, be careful for nothing. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, take no thought. He said that repeatedly, and that literally means don't worry about it. To give in to the temptation to sin, or to worry, is a sin. But there's a distinction to be made because we still have things in our life that burden us down. We still get bad news from the doctor. We still have financial troubles. We still lose jobs. Uh, we still have a messed up political system 
that we have to deal with. We have all kinds of things in our life that weigh us down. It's not a sin for us to acknowledge those things and to, to deal with those things and to process those things. It can become a sin when we flip over and begin to worry unnecessarily about those things. But we have these burdens, these things that are weighing us down. It's no fault of our own. We're not sinning because we've been affected by this. The question is, how do we lay that weight aside? I'm going to give you a word that hopefully will help you. For these worrisome weights, the way that you set them aside is through supplication. Prayer. So surrender those weights, those are the, the good things that are just hindering you. The things that are weighing you down, the burdens of this life, give them to God in prayer. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all your cares upon Him, for He careth for you. Again, Philippians chapter 4, Be careful for nothing, but in everything... By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Give your cares to the Lord in prayer. Take that weight off. Because as long as you are carrying it around, it's going to slow you down and it's going to tire you out. You're going to get fatigued and frustrated and ultimately faint because you're not running at God's pace. You can't. You can't run at God's pace carrying all those weights around. Let us lay aside the weights. But then, number two, it says that we need to lay aside the sin which doth so easily beset us. What is the sin which doth so easily beset us? This is an Interesting topic for dorm theology at Bible college. Some people say everyone has their own besetting sin. Other people say, no, it's talking about one particular sin. So what is it? Well, some say it's a sin of unbelief, and some say it's this sin, or some say it's that. I think the bigger point that we should take away from this verse is that any sin is a besetting sin. All sin is a besetting sin. So let's figure out, more importantly, what does it mean to have a sin beset us? Because I don't know about you, but I didn't use the word beset in conversation this week. We just think of besetting sin. Okay, that's the sin everybody struggles with. Well, hold on a second. There's an act actually a very interesting play on words in this verse. You see the word that is uh, in verse number one, the word compassed about or compassed, however you want to pronounce it. I pronounce it compassed in this context. You see that? It means surrounded, okay? We are surrounded by a crowd of witnesses. And this is in a good way because these are the people that are cheering us on that have said, hey, we can do it by the, we did it by the grace of God. You can too. But the word beset also means to surround. But it means it in a negative way. It means to be hemmed in. It's kind of like when you're driving down the interstate here, I-20. All right, you're going down the interstate, and all of a sudden you get in traffic. I know, hard to imagine, right? <laughs> you get in traffic, and, and you know everybody starts slowing down, and everything starts jamming up. And now you've got you've got cars in front of you, right behind you, and maybe beside you, and and you feel kind of hemmed in. Uh, most people don't really like that feeling. I, I like getting on the interstate, I like setting my cruise control, and I like just going. I don't want people crowding in on me, and I want people hemming me in. I don't want people riding my bumper, I try not to ride other people's bumper, I don't want them cutting me off, give me my space, alright? I'm all about social distancing on the highways. But the word beset here has that idea of being hemmed in so that you're slowed down. And what it's saying is, is that we need to get rid of the sin that will hem us in and keep us from being able to run at God's pace. What sin? All of it. Now, you may have a particular sin that you struggle with. It may be different from someone else's. But it doesn't matter if it's that one sin or any other sin. All sin must be expelled from our lives. You know, it's very hard.
to run well when you're hemmed in on all sides. We'll go back to this illustration of uh, professional runners. We've uh, gone to the uh, Fuzz Run 5K in Covington a few times, and, and when they start the race, they always say, uh, serious runners come to the front, recreational runners and walkers and those with strollers in the back. Why is that? Well, because there's some, when you have a run like that, the Fuzz Run has uh, about 2,000 participants in it. It's a huge group of people. And you have all different kinds of people there. There are some people there. Uh, they are, uh, you know, they're almost professional level runners. You know, they run in high school, they run in college, or, or they've been doing it for years, and, and they can run very far, very fast. You have other people like me who can't. And so uh, you don't want the people who are there and are serious about this thing having to be back in the middle of the pack and trying to work their way around and, and in danger, you know, in the danger of getting tripped up or something. It's just a frustration for them. It's actually somewhat dangerous. And so they want them up in the front so that they can be out ahead, they can have the space they need, they can have the room to run. And if we're going to run at God's pace, we need to have that same attitude about sin in our life. Get it away from me. Don't, don't even let it get close. Give me the space I need to run in holiness and righteousness. Because if, if it, sin is crowding in on me, it is very likely that I'm going to trip, I'm going to stumble, I'm going to fall. And then I'm going to have to brush myself off, make corrections, and keep on trying to run with wounds, bruises. And I don't want that. That's why we need to get rid of the sin. How do we get rid of sin? By repenting. Repentance is simply a change of mind that results in a change of direction. That's what repentance is. It's not a work. It's a decision. You choose, I don't want sin. I want to do what God wants me to do. That results in confession. Genuine sorrow works repentance that results in confession of sin. That's when you verbalize your agreement with God about your sin. Josh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I know there are people that say, well, that verse is not for Christians. Christians have been forgiven of all their sin because of what Jesus did. In the eyes of God, you are perfectly holy and sanctified. But there's not a person in this room that can honestly look me in the eye and say that you never sin. Okay? We all still sin. And when we sin, we need to deal with it properly. We need to get it out of our lives. We need the fresh cleansing of the guilt and the shame that comes with sinning so that we can continue to run like God wants us to run. So many times we toy with sin. We think it's not a big deal. It's just a little fault, just a little problem, just got a little attitude here, just got a little bad habit over there, just a little word there that I probably shouldn't have said it quite like that. And we have such a low view of sin. You know why? Because we have a low view of our Savior. We'll get to that in just a moment, as the verse says in verse 2, looking unto Jesus. If you really understood what Jesus had to go through to pay for every single sin that you've ever committed, you would not have a low view of that sin. You wouldn't think it's not a big deal. You would understand that every sin you've ever committed is a sin that nailed the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, that He bled and died for, and it is a sin that you should not coddle, that you should not entertain in your life. It is a sin that you should confess it and get rid of it as fast as you can so that you can get back to following your Savior. What do we have to do to run at God's pace? First of all, we have to lay aside the weights. These are things that may not be sinful in and of themselves, but we're carrying them around unnecessarily. Those are things, maybe they need to be surrendered to God. Maybe it's something we need to bring to the Lord in supplication and prayer and cast our cares on Him, but we need to get rid of them. Secondly, we need to lay aside the sin that will hem us in and slow us down and trip us up. And then to run at God's pace, number three, we need to keep our focus on Jesus. Look at verse number two of Hebrews 12. It says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In the race of life, our focus must be on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because He's the one who's charted the course. 
He is the author and the finisher of our faith. If we get our eyes off of Christ, we are going to veer aside in the wrong direction. You know, you know the illustrations here. You're cutting grass and you want to cut a straight line. What do you do? Well, you, you pick a spot out in the distance and you keep your eyes on that and you just head straight for it. If you do that, you look back, you'll probably have a pretty straight line. Well, what's the shortest distance from point A to point B? Are you all awake? Hello? Straight line. Thank you. So if you're running a race, are you going to run it down a straightaway veering back and forth side to side like this right here? Is that how you're going to run? No. If you're going to run, excuse me, if you're going to run a race competitively, you're going to go the shortest distance possible. You're going to go in a straight line. And if we're going to run in a straight line, we have to keep our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when we get our eyes off of Christ and we start looking around us, that's when we veer aside. We get worried about the praise of men. We get worried about our own personal success. We get worried about all the things that have to do with this life and we start going back and forth and we're wandering around. And, and in addition to just getting off course in general, we are using up very precious energy for pursuits that are unnecessary and unhelpful. And that's why sometimes we get exhausted in the Christian life is because we've wasted our energy because our focus wasn't on Christ. We have to be looking unto Jesus. Most specifically, what this means is that we follow His example in the way that we live. And I want to kind of tie this back in here. Because verse 1 tells us where to run with patience. How did Jesus live His life? Was Jesus ever in a hurry? Think about that. You feel free to come to me afterwards and correct me if I'm wrong in this statement. But as best as I could recollect, there was not a single instance in the Gospels of Jesus running anywhere. I can't find one. I think we need to follow our Savior. <laughs> Not that it means we can't run. But I think we kind of find a point in that. Because that, there was a, there's a bigger picture of Jesus in the Gospels that He was never in a hurry. In fact, there's several instances where everybody else was in a hurry and Jesus wasn't. Again, let's go back to Mary and Martha. Their brother Lazarus was sick. They sent him word. The human thou lovest is sick. What does Jesus do? Nothing. He doesn't do anything. And finally, the next day, he says, all right, let's, let's go down to Bethany. Because our friend Lazarus sleepeth. And the disciples said, well, good. If he's asleep, that means he's getting better. And Jesus said, guys, you don't get it. He's dead. Oh, so we're going for the funeral. Eh, sort of. And they get there, and Jesus comes up, and Martha approaches him, and what does she say? Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. You're too late. Now put yourself in Mary and Martha's position. Would you have been in a hurry? I would have been. Jesus, get here quickly. Lazarus is dying. And then Jesus shows up after he dies, after they've already buried him. What are you thinking? Jesus is late. Why didn't Jesus, as soon as he get the message, say, guys, we got to hurry up and get there? You say, well, he's Jesus. <laughs> That's why. He knew he was going to raise him from the dead. But do you not see the point? Jesus was content to wait on God's best timing. And he knew that the best timing in this situation was to let Lazarus die. Then he would, he would raise him from the dead and God would get the most glory for him, from it. I think there's other instances. What about the time they were in a boat and there was a big storm and they all thought they were going to drown? And what is Jesus doing? Sleeping. Was Jesus lazy? No, he was just tired. 
I, I, I'm so thankful that God included little things like that about Jesus in his earthly life. Jesus slept. Jesus got hungry. He needed to rest, just like you and me. And what is Jesus doing in the boat? The, these, some of them seasoned sailors thought they were going to die. They wake him up. Do you not care that we're perishing? And what does Jesus do? Does he bolt out of bed and start barking orders, you know, throw this over and pull down that sail. No, what does he do? He stands up. Peace. Be still. And that was all it took. And you go, you go, what about the story of the man who came to Jesus because his daughter was dying? And so Jesus turns to follow the man. But he's in a crowd and he's taking his time and a woman comes out and touches the hem of his garment. And what does Jesus do? He stops. And he turns and he addresses this lady. And while he's talking to her, a servant of the man comes up and says, don't bother Jesus anymore. She's dead already. What did Jesus do? Did he say, oh no, I better get there quick now. No. He just calmly went on, raised her back to life. Everything that Jesus did in his life, he did it at the Father's time. He didn't run ahead of his heavenly Father. He ran with patience. Now tonight, Lord willing, we're going to look at verse 2, and we're going we're to go even deeper here. We're going to see what was going on in the mind of Jesus that enabled him to have such incredible patience. But for now, we need to take this away. That running at God's pace means keeping our focus on Jesus and letting Him set the pace for our life. You know... If you were to ever run in a race in a group of people, if it was a, a, had a, you had a lot of different skill levels involved in that, you would quickly find out that some people run a lot faster than others. And a common mistake that runners make who are maybe just kind of getting into it or you know, working on building up is, is not pacing themselves. They try to run too fast, too quickly, and they end up exhausting all of their energy. And sometimes that happens because somebody close to you is running at a quicker pace and you kind of get this mentality, oh, I better keep up with them. And, and, or you see somebody come up and you look over and you think, well, I'm in much better shape than this person. I can keep up with them. And what you find is that because you're trying to run at somebody else's pace, you end up exhausted and you can't even finish or you don't do as well as you could have done if you'd paced yourself. What I'm saying to you this morning is we have to get our eyes off of everybody else and we have to get our focus back on Jesus because He is the only one we have to worry about. He should set the pace for us. And here's the thing about Jesus. He knows the pace you can handle. He's never going to push you farther or faster than you can go by His grace. Now, He will stretch you. He will pull you. He will challenge you like any good coach. He will say, come on, a little quicker. You can do it. But He knows what your limit is, and He will never push you farther than that. And as long as you are following Him, and as long as you are focused on Him, by His grace, you can keep going. You cannot faint. And that's how we run with patience, by running at His pace. I want to close with an illustration this morning. I brought a prop with me. We got a couple of guys in here who feign themselves to be runners. So, Caleb and Drew, can you come up here and help me, please? <clears throat> These are those weird people I've told you about in the past that run for fun. Right in the middle here. All right. Caleb, between you and Drew, who is the faster runner? Brother Drew? All right. 
So you're going to get the one, be the one that, that works with me here on this illustration. Brother Drew is a good runner, by the way. In all seriousness, he's worked hard over the last few years, and he is, he is doing a really good job. I'm proud of him. He's an encouragement to me. So I'm going to embarrass him today. <clears throat> Flip this on, if you would, please, Brother Drew. What is this? It's just a simple backpack. It's the one I use all the time for carrying around needful things. Now, Brother Drew, when you go out for a run, how many backpacks do you normally wear? You don't run, run, run with that. Run with any. Zero, right? All right. So already, now he's a little bit hindered. But now we're going to make it worse for him. So we talked about the weights that we carry around. The weights are things that are not necessarily sinful, but they're unnecessary. And they, they take our, our strength away. So I'm going to give you a couple weights here. This one here, I'm going to call it your hobby. What's your favorite hobby other than running? Eating, he said. All right? <laughs> not bad, but definitely could weigh you down. <laughs> Uh, let's give him another weight here. Not necessarily bad, but it's going to weigh him down. We're going to call this one his job. All right? Good thing he has a job. Good thing that he can uh, support his family. That's wonderful. But it can get out of place. But then there's other things that happen to us, things that can weigh us down. And um, let's say this one we're going to call bad news from the doctor. I don't know what it might be, but we're going to put this in here. If I can fit it. Oh, yeah. That'll go. All right. And this one here... Uh, we are going to uh, call this one, we'll just call this uh, worried about the election. That's a weight some people carry around, all right? So he's worried who's, who's going to win in November. Are the Democrats going to stay in control or are the, are the uh, Republicans going to gain control? And he's all worried, worked up about this because he watches too much Fox News anyway. And so puts it in there. All right. Now, Brother Drew, be honest. Is this heavy? Too bad. Not too bad. You could carry it around. You could probably walk around all day with it and it might be a little sore in the shoulders, but you'd be all right. Okay. Do you think you could run your best 5K carrying that backpack? Not a chance. Probably not, no. All right. These are the weights that are slowing him down. Now, guys, come over here because in just a minute we're going to have a race. Simple race across the auditorium there. Don't hit Miss Sharon's perambulator. Uh, we're going to see... Who can get to that wall the fastest? Oh, but wait. We also have the sins which doth so easily beset us. Remember those things that hem us in and slow us down. All right? So I need some sins to hem him in. Brother Lucius, your first candidate that comes to my mind. Uh, Levi, you come on up. And uh, uh, Brother Dean, why don't you come be a help helper for us here. And uh, Brother Barron, all right? These are, these are four besetting sins here. Now, what I want you guys to do is I want you to just stand right around Brother Drew. All right? You're just going to stand around in just a minute. I'm going to have to actually have you guys put your hands on each other's shoulders and just kind of hem them in. Okay? All right? All right? So, we're going to have this race here. Caleb's already admitted Drew's the fastest one of the two. But now he's weighted down. Now he's beset by sin. And we're going to have a race, and we're going to see who can get across the auditorium the fastest, all right? Oh, wait, there was one more thing. We talked about our focus being on Jesus, right? Now, in this illustration, the finish line's over there, so where are you going to be looking? Over there, if your focus is right. But it's not. So I need you to turn around and face the other direction. Okay. <laughs> all right, so here we go. I need my besetting sins. Put your hands on each other's shoulders. Hem him in really good. All right. First one to this wall over here gets to eat lunch with me today, all right? <laughs> On your mark, get set, go! <laughs> then Caleb wins, thank you so much. All right, let's give him a hand this morning. You can put that down now, thank you so much. Thanks for being a good sport. Anytime. Do you understand this morning? I know that's kind of... Very silly. But maybe it will kind of help us keep that picture in our mind. Because if he were to try and run any distance like that, he would very quickly wear out, become exhausted. There's no way that he could be a competitive runner doing that. And there's no way that we can run at God's pace like that spiritually. Lay aside the weight, lay aside the sin, 
keep our focus on Christ. And tonight we'll talk more about what Christ did. But just know this, you must keep your eyes on Him. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, There's a story told I read recently about the 1904 Olympics. And in those Olympics, they had what has been called the worst marathon ever. 32 men were all that competed in this marathon. And of them, only 14 finished. It was a debacle of every sort. The guy that organized this, this event decided that they only needed two water stations. Uh, he said that it would be best if we started at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the hottest part of the day. They didn't have the course marked out, and so they, they, had, to, uh, they had to battle traffic, go around trains and buggies. The road was so dusty, one guy ended up in the hospital because he got so much dust in his throat, he ruptured his esophagus coughing. Another guy got ran off course by uh, over a mile being chased by a pack of wild dogs. The man who actually won the race had to be carried across the finish line by his two trainers, and that was after they had given him brandy and strychnine for two miles to try and keep him going. It was terrible. Do you ever feel like that's the kind of race you're in right now? Do you ever feel like this is awful? This is, this is exhausting. I can't keep doing this. May I suggest to you this morning that you're not running at God's pace. There's weights you need to set aside. There's sins you need to get rid of. And you need to get your focus back on Christ. Not on yourself, not on others, but on your Savior. If you do that, then you know what the Bible says? That you can mount up with wings as eagles. You can run and not be weary. You can walk and not faint if you wait on the Lord. If you run at His pace, God will renew your strength. So that you don't have to feel constantly frustrated. You don't have to be constantly fatigued. And you don't have to faint. This morning, I want to invite you to come to God and lay aside your weights. Give up your sins and get your focus back on Jesus.